Hello, hello, hello. Come to the altar. Come forward, come to Jesus. Now is the time, don't wait any longer. Come forward, come close. The day of salvation is at hand. Come forward. We're gonna get started. Uh, if you're in this room, you are in the presence of the Romans Sunday School. So um, I'd like you to be close if you have any intention of being involved. There is a handout that I'm gonna try and work through. Uh, Pastor Nicholas is brandishing them. We might need to make a few more copies. There's 25, so if you want to share, feel free to share. But if we need to make more copies, we can. Um, we want to get started now simply because Romans is such a big, wonderful, theologically rich book, um, and I want to try and get through as much as we possibly can uh, uh, this morning and in the next 12 weeks or so. So do, do get a, a handout. Did you get a handout over there? You're awfully quiet over there. One for all six of you? That's, that's very kind. That's very kind. Yeah, don't, don't be bashful. Go get one. You can get up and find one. That's fine. Um, if you have a Bible, I'd invite you to open that up to the book of Romans while we're getting our things together here. What else can I say while we're getting ready? Oh, I can introduce myself. I can say something about myself. So, um, good morning. Oh, that's so kind of you to say good morning. Uh, my name is Zach. If you, I haven't met you in person, um, I hope to do so soon. Um, uh, let me just say a couple words about why I'm teaching this. Feel free to, just no, no pressure, no pressure. Let me say a few words about why I'm teaching this class. Um, I got into the study of biblical studies and theology back when I was in college. I took biblical Greek when I was in college and just absolutely loved it and never went back. And so I've been studying New Testament, Old Testament, biblical languages for a very long time. And um, I, the first job I got after my PhD, which was in Scotland, I got a, a job teaching New Testament in Ireland. And I was teaching at a Presbyterian seminary and I had done my doctoral work on one little tiny thing, and I dove really, really deep on that really narrow thing. And then I got to teach, and they were like, well, you've got to teach everything in the New Testament. You can't teach that one little topic. And the one class that I had not prepared for was Romans. They gave me Romans. They said, this one's yours. Don't mess it up. Um, and so I tried my best not to mess it up. But what I did was I started to just read as much as I possibly could about Romans. So I started to read all the books that I had that had passed me by over the years, all the articles, all everything, tried to watch as many videos and lectures on Romans, and I just fell in love with the book of Romans all over again. This was about six, seven years ago, and so that became my kind of yearly class to teach, and I made it my own, and I loved it. It became one of my favorite classes. Um, and now I've moved to RTS last year, and I've had the chance to teach it twice already, um, and so I've taught this through at the seminary level, at the college level, uh, s several times. And Pastor Reed, uh, Nicholas Reed, asked me to teach it here in uh, St. Paul Sunday School. And I'm delighted to do that. I absolutely love Romans. I love how Romans is a challenging book. It's kind of daunting. Like if you've tried to read it yourself recently, maybe you've found that it's, there's places in Romans where you get stuck, where you just don't know all the therefores and four, 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 and I don't know where I am anymore. I'm lost. What I want to do is be your guide and help you through Romans. Um, we're taking a seminary level class that's all loaded up into my head, and we're trying to narrow it down to basically 12 weeks, one hour, or 45 minutes at a time. So we're not going to be able to look at everything in as much detail as maybe you want to. So, but what I'm going to want to focus on is really the, the running argument, the running thought that Paul is continuing from chapter 1, verse 1 to the very end. That's what I want to focus on. I want to get the big picture, follow his train of thought all the way through. So that means we might have to leave a few details off to the side. And feel free to pester me with those. If I skip something you want to talk about, raise your hand. And if we have time at the end to clarify some things, that's totally fine. This morning, what I want to do is introduce the book. We want to talk about some background things and then get into what I think is the thesis of the book or the main idea of the book. Um, let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll jump right in. Our
Our Father in heaven, we do thank you that you are a God who speaks and that you have spoken in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Apostle Paul, the greatest witness of Jesus Christ, and we thank you for the letter to the Romans. We thank you for the impact that this letter has had through church history in the conversion of sinners, in bringing light to those in darkness, in giving hope to the hopeless, uh, for teaching us about Christ and all that he is for us. We pray, Lord, that this time this morning and this time uh, over the next 12 weeks would be a time where we can appreciate more deeply uh, the truth that we find in the gospel that Paul expounds for us in Romans. We pray that we would be focused and appreciative and thankful for the word that we have before us. Father, by your Holy Spirit, would you keep us attentive and grateful for every word that proceeds from your mouth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to begin with the simple question of what kind of book is Romans? What kind of book is it? And many of us approach the book of Romans with uh, a misunderstanding or at least an unhelpful approach to the book because we approach it sometimes thinking that it's a systematic theology. Okay, we've only been in here for like two minutes and I've already said systematic theology. I apologize. But I've only brought it up to knock it down and get it out of your head. Romans is not a systematic theology. Now, no offense to anyone who likes systematic theology. No offense to any professional systematic theologians in the room. My boss is a systematic the theologian, and he's right there. Romans is not a systematic theology. Now, what does that mean? That means that Paul did not set out in Romans to summarize everything there is to know about Christianity. Sometimes we approach the book of Romans that way. Some famous Christians and theologians in the past have described Romans that way. Martin Luther, he's like the biggest champion of the book of Romans. He said, Paul in Romans is summarizing the whole Christian faith, the whole Christian doctrine. Now, there's a grain of truth to that because Romans is massively big and it's a wonderful exposition of the gospel. But let me tell you, it's not a systematic theology. It's not a systematic summary of everything there is to know about Christian doctrine, okay? Has anyone tried to read a systematic theology? Raise your hand. Yeah, we've got a couple timid hands, yes. Reading a systematic theology is difficult. And if you read Romans, sometimes it feels like a systematic theology, but I don't want you to think of it that way. I want you to think about it differently. What are some of the problems with that idea that Romans might be kind of a summary of everything in the Christian faith. Let me name one problem for you. Well, why doesn't he talk about a bunch of important stuff? Right? So think about Romans. Just you, We haven't talked away, all the way through it yet, but there's a lot of stuff missing from Romans if it's a systematic summary of everything there is to know. For example, Paul never actually goes into detail about the second coming of Christ in Romans. Now, he absolutely believes in it, and he thinks it's a very important thing, but he doesn't really talk about it in Romans. Another thing he doesn't really talk about is the divinity of Jesus in the book of Romans. Now, it's assumed he believes it. It's part of the background of what Paul is writing, but he never actually deals with it in an overt, explicit way. The Lord's Supper. Did Paul believe in the Lord's Supper? Absolutely, yeah, and he thought it was crucial for the Christian faith, but he never mentions it once in Romans. So that should make us pause for a minute, tap the brakes for a second. Paul is doing something different than summarizing everything there is to know about Christianity. He's doing something more specific. Now, why else might it be dangerous? I'm going to actually ask for someone's involvement here, I'm gonna actually chip in here say an answer to this. Why else might it be dangerous to view Romans as a systematic theology or a summary of all of Christian doctrine? What might that do to the way you approach the book? 
Any thoughts? Yeah. The, you like the historical context of the letter? Yeah, very good. So if you think it's a systematic theology, that's, it's just kind of timeless. It doesn't really have a, it's not grounded in the dirt of the first century, so to speak. And Romans very much is grounded in the dirt of first century. We'll talk about what that means. Any other suggestion there? Yeah. That's exactly right. You've got to think about the audience. One uh, danger that I've noticed is that we tend to view Romans in a very segmented way. We don't see how chapter 5 relates to chapter 2 or chapter 8 relates to chapters 9 through 11. And in fact, one of the most... Uh, uh, well-known standard commentaries on the book of Romans was by a guy named Cranfield. Uh, standard, gold standard commentary like among academics. And he actually said, he actually said that Romans 9 through 11, chapters 9 through 11, are an appendix that Paul didn't know where to put. It was like really good stuff. It was a really good sermon and he didn't know where to put them in Romans. So he's just like, well, this is as good a place as any, as any right after chapter 8. That to me is insane. That's absurd. Um, Romans 9 through 11 are not an appendix. They are, they are absolutely integrally related to Paul's whole argument from chapter 1. So if you think about it as here's a chapter on God, here's a chapter on Jesus, here's a chapter on the Holy Spirit, like a systematic theology would do, you don't see the organic connection all the way through. So one of the things I want to communicate to you and emphasize is that Paul has a train of thought, and it leaves the station in chapter 1. And if you don't hop on in chapter 1, you're going to be way left behind, and you'll jump into chapter 7 and be like, I don't know what's going on. Or you'll, you'll misunderstand it, you'll misinterpret it. Chapters 9 through 11, just to use that illustration again, uh, is called by another commentator, the climactic vindication of everything Paul was doing in chapters 1 through 8. I think that's more on target. If we're reading carefully and closely from chapters 1 and following, we will actually follow his train of thought, think his thoughts after him, because it's a consistent, coherent argument he's making from chapter 1. So that's my point in the handout, uh, 1B. It's a letter. It's a letter written to specific people with specific problems, and he has a specific answer to their problems, and that answer is a consistent, coherent argument. Now, what is it? What's the argument I'm hearing you say? Well, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, well, I will tell you, but just not right now. Hold on. If you're going to be in this class, you're going to have to deal with suspense. I'm going to leave you in suspense. Sometimes it'll be like a couple seconds of suspense. <laughs> Sometimes it'll be a few minutes. Maybe it'll be a few weeks of suspense. Right now, it's just a few minutes of suspense. Let's talk about a few background contextual issues that are important for understanding Romans. What was happening in Rome? A really interesting thing happens uh, in 49 AD. In 49 AD, the Roman emperor Claudius uh, issued an edict, or basically just this command, to expel all the Jews from Rome. Okay? Now, Christianity is already in Rome. Can you tell the difference if you're a Roman emperor between a Christian and a Jewish Christian? Probably not. And what happens is that Jewish Christians are expelled from Rome too. Turn to Acts chapter 18 real quick. This is one of those places where the Bible and Roman history line up perfectly. There's a Roman uh, historian called Suetonius, Suetonius who tells us precisely about this edict, and he says he expelled all the Jews from Rome. Acts chapter 18 lines up precisely with that. And you'll see some familiar names here. Uh, Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. Okay, so that's just an offhand remark by uh, uh, Luke in the book of Acts that lines up perfectly with this historical event. Why is that significant? Well, Claudius is going to die and be succeeded by the emperor Nero. And when he dies, the edict lapses and the Christians can come back. How do we know? And the Jews can come back. How do we know? Because Romans 16, you don't need to turn there, 
the first people that get greeted are Priscilla and Aquila. So they're back in Rome. So less than 10 years later, they are back in Rome. Now, I want you to do a thought experiment. Why, why are we talking about this? Well, thought experiment for a minute. What if our church suddenly was ruptured and half of us were expelled from Orlando? And it happened to be a particular ethnic group suddenly removed from the church. Picture that for a minute. They're, they've, they're gone. The church is still going to meet. Those of us who are left behind, we're still going to meet. We're going to grow. We're probably going to find a new pastor, probably find a new set of elders, replace the ones that are lost. We're going to start developing our own style of doing things. Six, seven years later, the edict lapses, and then all the Jews come back. The second half of the congregation comes back. What's going to happen? You can tell me, what's going to happen? Confusion, division, misunderstanding, like a misunderstanding right here. Excuse me, ma'am, you're in my pew. <laughs> my family's been sitting in this pew for 25 years. You're not going to sit in my pew. I'm just kidding. Obviously, they don't have pews back then, but you get the point. Uh, excuse me, you're not the pastor of this congregation. Excuse me. That's my family to chef. So you can imagine all sorts of problems that are going to occur when Christians get separated and then are forced back together and have to get, to get along with one another. Christians have a hard time as it is, uh, much less after developing their own ways of doing things and then coming back together. Now, am I just making this up? Well, let's look at a few key passages in Romans that actually reflect sort of the dynamics of a group that is divided, where there's jealousy, where there's strife going on. Um, I've listed a few references for you in uh, section 2.B. So looking at Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And I'm just going to breeze through these real quick. Therefore, chapter 2, verse 3, Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because the judge, uh, because you yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Uh, press on. Look at 2.17. If you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you, are, you're, you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, knowing in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? Okay, let's keep going on. What's the next one? 327, he says, where is boasting. What becomes of boasting? So we've got judgment, condemnation, boasting. Press on to chapter 11, verse 17. Paul here likens the people of God to an olive tree, and he says branches were broken off. The unbelieving Jews were broken off. And so he says, but if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, that is, you Gentiles, we're grafted in among others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant towards the branches. You've got judgment, condemnation, boasting, and arrogance. Look at chapter 12, verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Okay? And then the last one, chapter 14, verse 1. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Okay, so you're getting the point here, right? The point is that in the Roman congregation, we have judgment, condemnation, condemnation quarreling, arrogance. boasting, arrogance, pride. pride, 
Okay? Maybe you never saw that emerge from the text of Romans, but it gives Romans a whole lot more color. That Rom- Romans is being written by Paul to deal with a congregation that are at odds with one another. And the lines of that division, the, the lines of the conflict, are clearly Jew-Gentile, or at least related to that, because chapter 14, when he's talking about eating food or not, or abstaining, these are kosher food laws that they're fighting over. And he named them explicitly in chapter 2. If you call yourself a Jew, don't you teach yourself when you claim to teach others? Let me give you just one last uh, reference that is great. Uh, The beginning of chapter 15, verse 2. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Why? For Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony, I love this, such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The purpose of the church is to sing together with one voice. You don't have to be singing the same note, but sing in harmony with one another. Everything in Romans is leading up to this. This is the climax of Romans, by the way. I'm giving the secret away. I'm tipping my hand here. This is the high point of Romans. Everything is leading up to this. Um, So anyway, we've got to move on. So you've got the point. Do you have the point? Do, Do I need to clarify anything? The problem in Rome is that the Christians are divided and they're quarreling, they're judging and condemning one another. Okay, now, stay in chapter 15 because that is where Paul actually starts to give some details about what's going on in his life. That's what's going on in Rome. What's going on in Rome? Fights, quarreling. What's going on in Paul's own ministry? Three cities. Uh, man, we need, to, we need to move. Three cities are mentioned in this passage that are relevant. And I won't be able to look in detail at all of these, but the first city to keep in mind is Jerusalem. Paul tells us in uh, 1522 and following, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's at the end of his third missionary journey, and he is cruising towards Jerusalem. And people are telling him, don't go. They're going to arrest you. And he says, I've got to go. I've got to go. Why is he going to Jerusalem, and why is he so intent on going to Jerusalem? Do you know why? The Jerusalem collection. You have listened to Pastor Justin. Pastor Justin, this is like his favorite thing, and it's one of my favorite things too. The Jerusalem collection. It's like the best kept secret in the New Testament. It was the Apostle Paul's biggest project in his apostolic career. It was his biggest project, the Jerusalem collection. And we don't know hardly anything about it to our detriment. The Jerusalem collection, he tells us right here in chapter 15 that he's collecting money, funds from Gentiles, from Macedonia and Achaia, and taking them to the needy saints in Jerusalem. This was a massive project that really gave Paul a lot of anxiety and stress, but it drove him on. Uh, and he says, if, if the Gentiles have benefited spiritually from the Jews, they got, they got the blessings of the Jewish Messiah. If the Gentiles all over the Mediterranean have got spiritual blessings from the Jews, it's only right that they should give some material blessings back. That's only right. Now, that's a phenomenal thing to say, but we don't have time to focus on it. The point is he's on his way to give that collection to the uh, needy saints in Jerusalem. Now think about that for a second. Think about the powerful symbolism of that, just for a second. Are you saying that the problem in Rome is somehow related to the gift that Paul is giving in Jerusalem? Think about that. This is, in one way, dirty Gentile money, isn't it? Could you imagine how that gift could go wrong in Jerusalem? Where'd that money come from, Paul? Do do those coins have the picture of Caesar on it? 
Who, who's been handling this money? Money, that's right, yeah. This could go wrong. This could be rejected. And so he actually says, pray for me. Pray for me. Where does it say that um, in chapter 15? Verse 30, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Pray for me that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. This could go wrong. But it's very, very important for Paul that the symbolism, the theological symbolism of Gentiles giving their money to the Jew, the needy saints in Jerusalem, the symbolic weight of that is significant to him. It's only right that the Gentiles demonstrate their solidarity with the Jewish believers by giving relief to those in need. We're not entirely sure why they're in need. It could be famine, could be persecution. It doesn't really matter. The less specifics I know, the better, because it's more impetus for me to see how I can reach across those barriers and actually demonstrate solidarity with other believers, regardless of ethnic or cultural distinctions. And so that's highly significant. Do you see the connection I'm trying to make? The problem in, Ro in Rome is disunity. The symbolism of the gift that he's going to give is unity. Now, what provides the foundation and the context for that unity? The gospel. The gospel, which we're going to get to in just a moment. But now, the second uh, city that he has in mind, and this is not a city, it's a place, it's a country, Spain. He has his sights set on Spain. So his immediate goal is Jerusalem. His long-term goal is Spain. He wants to plant churches where no one has heard of Christ. And so he develops that in chapter 15, verse 28, and 19 through 21. And that, that puts Rome right in the middle. So Jerusalem, Spain, Rome is right in the middle. Maybe if you can see that. So Jerusalem, Spain, Rome. What, what's Rome got to do with it? Well, he wants to use them as a sending base. He wants to be helped along to Spain by them. Now, uh, this is quite interesting. So let me just quote from uh, Thomas Schreiner's, this is the big quotation, I'm going to read it kind of slowly and just comment on a few of these things. I think it captures well, brings all these things together to tell us what's going on in Rome, what's going on in Paul's life, and why did he write the letter. Paul wrote to unify the church through his gospel so that the two groups would function harmoniously. Such unity could be obtained only by a thorough explication of Paul's gospel. For Paul's advice would be heeded only if the Romans were persuaded that his understanding of the gospel was on target, especially in relationship to the Mosaic law and the place of Israel in salvation history. We'll come back to that later. In other words, the Pauline gospel was to be the basis of unity for the Roman congregations. I would also add to that that the Pauline gospel is the only means of attaining unity. It's when you properly understand the gospel and the implications of the gospel that enables you to be unified. I'll, I'll explain what that means as we go, but Rome could spare, scarcely be the sending base if the churches were torn apart by strife. Nor would they wholeheartedly champion Paul's mission if they were uncertain about or disagreed with his theology. Thus, just as Paul had, had to set forth his teaching to resolve the disputes between Jews and Gentiles, so too his teaching had to be embraced for them to support his mission. I'll end the quote there and uh, give my summary. In other words, last line on the handout on uh, page one, Paul wrote Romans to introduce the gospel that he preached and to secure the unified support of the divided Roman Christians. So, He's not giving us everything there is to know about Christian doctrine. He's giving us enough to be unified in the gospel, to be a sending base for his pioneer missionary work. Let me pause there before we get to the back of the handout and see if there's any questions for clarification.
I'm not sure. Right. I'd probably say the first one. Yeah. So he's, he's giving a summary exposition of the gospel and he's highlighting certain aspects that are extremely relevant to their situation. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the back of the handout. And this is way too much information to deal with in the next 15 minutes. It's 15 minutes, right? Whew. Awesome. I don't. I think that's a surprise to everyone else. <laughs> but we'll just press on and see where we get to. Okay. So, what is the train of thought that leaves the station in chapter one and pushes on uh, to the end? And how can we get on board? Well, the first thing we got to do is go back to chapter one and look at what is the thesis statement. This is the. This is the core foundational statement that everything is going to be unpacking and expositing. Chapter 1, verse 16 through 17. Uh, well, it begins with 4, so we've got to read the previous verse, sorry. Uh, it also begins with a conjunction, so let's go back up to verse 14. Verse 14, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Okay, just pause there. Um, you know, like only Paul can get away with this. Like he doesn't say, I want to preach the gospel to you because I love you. He says, I'm under obligation. I've got to. I'm obligated. The risen Lord Jesus met me on the road to Damascus and said, go preach. So Paul's not going to you know, waste his time with niceties. I am under obligation. There's a weightiness to this that we've got, that's got to grip us if we want to appreciate it. Four, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Knowing what we know about all the strife and the judgment and the condemnation, those words now have a bit more meaning, don't they? For in it, what's it? Okay, if you're reading the Bible and you see the word it or him and you don't even know what it's referring to, stop. Don't read any further. Go back up and make sure you know what it is. Okay, verse 17, what's it? The gospel, right? If you're thinking, how did you get that answer? How did everyone know that? By slowing down and reading several verses at a time over and over and over again. Read them slowly. Look at this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it, it is the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. Verse 17 says something else about the gospel. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Um, we're going to talk about this righteousness of God. This is what energized Paul. It's what's kind of energizing me too, right? This is what drove Paul to preach the gospel all over the Mediterranean, getting his head bashed in as he went being disowned by his countrymen to endure imprisonment and shipwrecks and quarreling with people like the Corinthians. Why did he endure all of that? Because he was so passionate about the gospel because it reveals the righteousness of God. What is the righteousness of God? I want to know what that is. And that's a confusing, vague phrase, isn't it? Well, there's two senses, two very related senses to the righteousness of God that we need to appreciate. We need them both because they support one another, and they're both crucial to understand the gospel. The first one is that the righteousness of God refers to God's own attribute of being righteous. He is a righteous God. Now, how do we define that way? Flip over to chapter 3 very quickly. Um, 
I've given you a few references to where that sense of the righteousness of God comes out clearly. Chapter 3, verse 5. And again, let's just back up a couple of verses. Uh, verse 3. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you, you God, may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. That's a quote from Psalm 51, which is where David committed adultery. And then this is his psalm of penitence saying, you are right, you are true, I am a liar, I am unrighteous. Verse 5, but if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath? I speak in a human way by no means. Stop there. The entire point of reading that is simply to say that when Paul says the righteousness of God, it has one clear, distinct sense of God's attribute of being righteous. He is a righteous God. He is upright. He is true. He stands by his word. He does what he promised. And he, therefore, is the kind of God you can trust. Why is that significant? That's huge. That is foundational stuff. Because if God is not righteous, we have a big problem. Look at another verse. This is interesting. Chapter 3, verse 25. He's talking about the cross. Uh, beginning in verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. So that means it's bearing the wrath of God uh, by his blood on the cross, by the death of Christ, to be received by faith. Look at this. In the middle of verse 25, this was to show God's love what did the cross show? God's righteousness. Now, it does show his love. We'll get there in chapter 5. But here, the point is that the cross shows God is righteous. How so? Well, previously, he passed over sins. See that? Verse 25. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. If the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins, what was God doing in the Old Testament? He was passing over sin. Does God eternally pass over sin? That would make him an unrighteous God. So the punishment, the wrath of God on the cross that we see poured out on Christ is a demonstration God upholds what is right. Because the gospel has forgiveness for sins in it does not mean God does not take account of our sin. He, he knows every jot and tittle of our sin, every single detail, because it was poured out on Christ. But that makes him a just God. And Paul is saying that the gospel reveals the justice and righteousness of God. The gospel reveals it. There was a time when I was a boy um, where I saw my dad chopping wood. Okay, now, my dad doesn't look like me. He actually has muscles. He's physically imposing. And even though I grew up in Florida, he chopped wood all the time. Can't have a fire, but we can chop wood. So we have stacks of wood just, you know, out in the back. We're never going to burn it for anything, but he can chop, I mean... I remember seeing him chop wood, and my eyes just went, Poof. I knew he was strong. I had tried to wrestle him before, right? I knew he was strong. But there was a moment in history in which his strength was revealed to me. See what I'm saying? There was a moment where I saw the reality of what I always knew was true. It broke into history, so to speak, for me. What Paul is saying is that in the gospel, it is a historical moment where the heavens were pulled back. 
They were ripped open. And God demonstrated his righteous character. That's really, really important that we grasp that. Because God is the kind of God who makes promises, isn't he? The Old Testament is full of them. Promises, promises, predictions. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be this for you. This is going to happen. I'm going to do this. Read the prophets. Read the Pentateuch. Um, Paul says there was a day, there was a day when all of that came true, where God proved he keeps his promises. That day is the ministry of Jesus Christ. The gospel demonstrates, reveals, shows to us what we knew was true, but now it has come into reality, into space-time. God has demonstrated his righteousness, that he, practically speaking, is the kind of God you can trust. Okay, that's only half the story, though, because if God is just and righteous, that's really bad news for you and me, because if God does what he says he's going to do, I'm smoked. I'm done. I'm done. I don't have a snowball's chance in central Florida. I'm done because I know what goes on in my own heart. If God is upright and he doesn't bend toward evil, he doesn't take a bribe, he doesn't pervert justice, he executes right judgments. That's what righteousness is. He is a just judge. If he does that, I'm in big, big trouble. And I don't want the righteousness of God. And that's what Martin Luther, the famous reformer, uh, said, if you read his, the preface to his uh, collected writings, he says, I hated the righteousness of God. If it wasn't enough for God to make me human and make me inherit guilt and sin from Adam and just be a terribly miserable sinner, if it wasn't enough for him to do that, now he's going to hang over my head the fact that he's a just judge? That's not fair. And so, to his credit, he says, so I, I badgered the Apostle Paul at Romans 1.17. You ever notice? If you've read that passage, it's great. I badgered the Apostle Paul. I pestered him. I went back and back and back to read. What is Paul saying? You know, like, just a practical lesson there is so many of us, we get tripped up, and then we're like, well, I'm not going to read that again. I don't understand it. It took me, like, five minutes, and I don't get it yet, so... I'm done. But Luther is tripped up by it. He's so angry about it. He goes back to it and back to it and back. To it. He badgers the Apostle Paul. Can you actually say you've ever badgered the Apostle Paul? Are you too holy for that? Have you badgered the scripture? And then it opens his eyes. He sees the context of actually what's happening here, which I'm going to get to in a moment. Suspense. And he says, the gates of paradise opened for me. And then I basked in the beauty and the glory of the righteousness of God. And then what do you have? The Protestant Reformation and eventually Presbyterianism. So because of Paul Luther's reluctance to give up, we have inherited so much. And that should be just a little bit of more motivation this week Next week, when you're trying to understand something, you're like, I'm just baffled by this. Well, I'll close my Bible and let Zach tell me later. No, badger the scripture. Look into it as closely as you can and read and meditate. Try and try again. Anyway, that's enough uh, preaching for now. Okay, second aspect of the righteousness of God that we must attend to is not the attribute of God's personal righteousness, that he's upright. That is absolutely true, and Paul does intend to include that here. But there's also a second aspect, a beautiful, wonderful, new aspect that we have not seen clearly until the gospel, and it's that righteousness is a gift that God gives. It's a gift that he gives to those who believe. Where can we find that? Three 22, chapter 3, verse 22. But now the righteousness of God, this is verse 21, sorry. 
But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, verse 24, and are justified by his grace as a gift. Look over at chapter 5, verse 17. For if because of the one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. The last one to point to is chapter 10, verse 3. The last place where we see clearly that righteousness is not simply God's character, but his gift. 10, 3. For being ignorant, he's talking about the unbelieving Jews, ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. So you can see there that what's being opposed is God's righteousness that they've rejected and they want to establish their own. Okay, so in those three passages, we see clearly that righteousness is not simply God's character, it's a gift. This is the moment that Luther has where he says, I understand the gospel now. I understand the gospel now. And it changed everything for him. So God's righteousness is not simply his character, it's a gift that he gives in Christ. And if you can get that, that's huge. It's a massive, massive concept that's going to help you understand Romans. Actually, both of those senses, they, are, um, they need one another. Both, they're two sides of the same coin. They need one another. We don't want to have a God who gives us his righteousness, but himself is not righteous. Why would we not want that? Who forgives sins and makes people righteous and declares them righteous, but himself is not upright. Why would that be bad? It'd make him a hypocrite, yeah, yeah. Heaven would be hell, yeah. It would mean we don't live in a moral universe. It would mean he doesn't hold people accountable for their sin. It would mean that there are men and women who have done terrible, hor- there's the devil who would not be held accountable We don't want that. But we also don't want a God who is upright, who doesn't actually bestow that on anyone else. Because we saw earlier, that would mean we're, we're done for. We're toast. So these two sides of the coin of the righteousness, they're necessary to keep together. They must be held together. And if you have them both together, you'll understand Romans a whole lot more that Paul can sometimes be emphasizing the integrity and the truth and the uprightness of God. He does that a lot in Romans. He defends the upright character of God. That's very important to Paul, that in the gospel, he's not going back on his promises. He's not changing the rules in the gospel. The gospel is not a negation of the Old Testament. That would make God rather unrighteous and unreliable. Even though the gospel is revealed apart from the law and the prophets, it's in accordance with them. Um, Look at the quotation that Paul makes in uh, verse 17. For as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Where does that quotation come from? Habakkuk. I I like asking the question so I can hear how you pronounce it before I pronounce it. I get mocked wherever I go for saying Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Is that okay? Are we agreed that that's a a fine way to pronounce it? Okay. Habakkuk. Okay. Habakkuk. You don't have to turn there. You'll never find it. It's between Nahum and Zephaniah, if that makes it easier. What's Habakkuk about? Habakkuk begins with words that you didn't know 
Christians were allowed to say. God, where are you? God, are you sleeping? I've been calling. You're not answering. Uh, what's going on? Are you, you got a day off up there? Habakkuk is rather angry and rather forward with God, the God of the universe, by the way, who had made promises to Israel. And those promises looked like they were worthless because the, uh, the nation of Israel was absolutely surrounded and was about to be creamed by foreign armies. Where are you, God? <laughs> Show up. At stake in the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk, at stake in that book is the righteousness of God. Isn't that really interesting? The prophet says, where are you? Do what you said you're good at doing, judging sin and protecting Israel. Why aren't you doing that? But really, really interesting is the additional aspect that now the quotation itself that Paul makes talks about righteousness in the other way. Did you notice that? The quotation comes from the part where God says to Habakkuk, well, wait for it. The oracle will come. The day will come when I do actually step in. Wait for it. The one who is puffed up in heart, forget about him. The righteous one will live by faith. That is the one who trusts that God is actually going to do what he said he's going to do. Isn't that really interesting that Habakkuk has both sides of the righteousness of God, just like Romans does, where at stake is the question, is God worthy to be trusted? Have you ever asked that question? Have your family members ever asked that question? The prophet Habakkuk has asked that question. Paul deals with that question over and over and over again. Can God be trusted? Is he righteous? And the prophet, we learn, yes. But equally as important, equally as important is that righteousness is by faith. That is, there's a righteousness available to you when you believe, when you trust in him, when you put your faith in him, when you entrust yourself to that God. In spite of what is going on before your eyes, we walk by faith, not by sight. So one of the key things that I want to impress upon you as we go through Romans is that what Paul is trying to articulate for us and expound and explain is how the gospel shows us that God is upright, righteous. He does what he says he's going to do. When we look at the gospel, we see that. We see the character of God in action, on display for the whole world undeniable, and it's wonderful, and that the way that you get into a relationship with him is by faith, and in faith, he actually gives a gift of his own righteousness in Christ Jesus. Uh, so the quotations I've got for you there are a couple commentators who make the point that I've been making that the righteousness of God has that dual sense. I'm not going to read them because they're just going to basically reiterate what I've been saying, but you can read them on your own time. I'm not making this up. These respected people have already said it as well. Uh, I will mention, though, the comment by John Murray where he refers back to Romans 1.17 and says that the righteousness of God is there a God righteousness. Isn't that good? It's a God righteousness. So when Paul says that the righteousness of God is revealed, it is is so intimately connected with who God is, so, so closely describing who he is, that we can call it a God righteousness. But yet at the same time, it's that righteousness that we need if we're going to survive the judgment. But they're so integrally connected that we can call them a God righteousness. Okay, um, I have a couple strategies to keep us going for the next few weeks to suggest to you here. But before I do that, we're basically out of time. Any questions for clarification or, or anything else? Let me, let me stop here and see if there's any complaints or issues we need to deal with.
I have a hard time believing there's no questions. Yes, sir. Mm. Good question. Yeah, so when Paul emphasizes the righteousness that's a gift or the righteousness that's an attribute, same exact word in Greek, same word. Yeah, good question. The question was, is the righteousness of God as an attribute and the righteousness that's a gift, is that the same word used in Greek? And the answer is yes, same one. Yep. Okay, a couple strategies I'll suggest to you, and then we'll close in prayer. Um, if you get stuck in Romans, ask the question, what does the gospel reveal? Okay, if you're stuck in a chapter and you're like, I don't know how to make sense of this, ask, what is this thing talking about? What does the gospel reveal about this? And nine times out of 10, I find that really helps us press forward and make progress in the book of Romans because the whole thesis statement of Romans is that the gospel is a revelation. It's an unveiling of something. And we learn all sorts of stuff in the gospel. So if you get stuck, ask that question. It might help you. Uh, strategy B, ignore chapter verse numbers when you can. When possible, ignore the chapter verse numbers. I'll show you a great illustration of this next week where chapter numbers really mess us up. And then finally, uh, just keep those two senses of righteousness in mind that God is upright and he actually gives the righteousness to those who believe in Christ. If you keep those both together as a complex but important topic, it will help you understand the message of Romans. Those are my suggestions, but I hope to see you next week. Let's close in prayer uh, and we'll, we'll be done. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who can be trusted. And we thank you, Lord, for the way that um, you have acted in history, in Jesus Christ, and the way that the Apostle Paul has expounded for us and explained it to us in a way that we can understand. We pray, Lord, that these words would challenge us and inspire us, that they would um, sink down deep into our hearts and change who we really are, uh, make us more like Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Thanks, everyone. See you next week.